On this edition of AEW Dynamite, or All Elite Review, I should say, we're going to be covering the uh, fallout of AEW Full Gear on this edition of AEW Dynamite. Let's get into it. This is All Elite Review. What's happening ladies and germs, this is the Packer Man and welcome to today's edition of All Elite Review. As you can see I got a bit of a different setup for my videos now in terms of the background and all the other stuff. <coughs> Thought I'd make it look a little bit cooler. It's similar to what I had uh, for the full gear review. Um, but uh, today we're going to be reviewing um, the uh, seventh episode of AEW Dynamite, Wednesday Night Dynamite. Uh, this was the Fallout show from AEW Full Gear, which took place um, last Saturday night. And uh, before we get into uh, this review and a couple other things I want to get into, I kind of want to put a period on the whole uh, AEW Full Gear uh, thing. So let's get into that for a quick second. Now, some of you who some of you who may have watched my review, uh, I gave the show a ten out of ten. Um, and here's the thing, the fact, I, I gave it a 10 out of 10 because it was a pretty freaking awesome show. I mean, was it a perfect show? No, it was not. There were still, you know, some things here and there that were a little iffy. Um, but, you know, the fact of the matter is a lot of the, sh a lot of the stuff that we saw, uh, with AEW, uh, Full Gear was just too damn good. I mean, uh, and all the nitpicky stuff, I mean, it might as well have been just drowned out by all the awesome stuff that we saw at Full Gear. And there were some people that didn't really like it, you know, the first 75% of Full Gear. And they're saying that some of the matches were atrocious, and I'm just kind of like, what the fuck are you watching? <sighs> Got that fucking WWE mindset. It's fucking ridiculous. But, you know, in my opinion, it was a damn good show. And... You know, it was well worth, I mean, I feel like I got, you know, all the value out of my $50 and then some. You know, it was a lot of good matches. Didn't feel bored the entire show. My brother can attest to that as well. He was on the review with me. And even he said, you know, and he was, and um, he hadn't watched a full wrestling show in years. And, you know, I said, well, let's, let's watch Full Gear. Um, and uh, he, he loved it. I mean, he didn't feel bored the entire time we were watching it for the whole three and a half hours the show was. You know so I mean there isn't really much else you, I can say about that but uh, you know one of the big things that kind of came out of full gear was the fact that um, there was a lot of uh, divisive opinions on the Kevin Ome Kenny Omega uh, John Moxley match the lights out match and uh, I personally enjoyed the hell out of it I mean there were some cringe inducing moments but you know that's, <laughs> that's just the name of the game but, you know, as someone who's enjoyed hardcore wrestling, you know, in the past, I mean, it, it definitely, uh, it, I definitely enjoyed it for the most part. And I'm definitely on the side of the ones that are, that enjoyed it. And then, you know, there's the other side that, thought, oh my God, it's not, uh, it's not the type of wrestling I want to be watching, you know, and all this other stuff. You know, and maybe that's the ultimate sign of its success is how divisive you know the opinions are and all the arguments and shit because as far as I can as far as I see it there's three ways to get your match uh, noticed and talked and become the most talked about thing in wrestling uh, one it could be the most hated thing ever see uh, the hell in a cell match between Seth Rollins and the fiend uh, it can be a universally loved match like say for instance Cody Rhodes against his brother Dustin at uh, double or nothing or you split the room. A match that is so divisive that it, you know, it causes a lot of, you know, online discussion, you know, and arguments and uh, differing opinions. And that's exactly what uh, John Moxley and Kenny Omega did. But, uh, you know, whether you like the match or not, you still got to respect them for going out there and putting their bodies on the line. 
you know, and, and they didn't need to put on a match like this, but they said, you know what, let's go out and tore, tear the fucking house down. And that's exactly what they did. So, you know, I said that the, that match alone was worth the price of admission, and we got a lot of good wrestling, you know, out of the rest of the card anyways, at least in my opinion. Some people might not agree, but you know what, that's their deal. That's their, that's a you problem, as far as I'm concerned. All right, before we get started with this uh, review, uh, here's a real quick injury report uh, coming out of AEW Full Gear. Um, a lot of the elites certainly suffered a lot of injuries. Uh, let's start at the bottom here. Britt Baker, I don't know if you could technically count this as an injury, but um, as it turned out, her match with B Priestley was originally supposed to be on the pay-per-view itself. So I'm guessing that Janela and Spears was supposed to originally be on the pre-show, but uh, they had to switch things around because uh, Britt Baker was actually suffering from the flu. Um, and if you tried to do anything under the inf under uh, the flu, it's not the easiest thing in the world. And her, for her to go out and try to put on a good match, um, I mean, that speaks, speaks a lot to uh, how passionate she is about the wrestling business because, I mean, she could have, you know postpone this match or something like that until a later date but she actually tried to go out there and put on a good match so that's uh, that's good on her for trying to do so um, but now let's get to uh, what happened with the elite because <laughs> uh, they're pretty freaking banged up uh, in particular um, hangman Adam page uh, reported that uh, he actually suffered he thinks he suffered a stinger uh, during his match with pack and if you don't know what a stinger is it's basically similar to a pinched nerve where um, you like lo you lose feeling in your arm and hand, and sometimes it causes your hand to cramp up and st shit like that. So uh, he thinks he suffered uh, a stinger in that match, uh, which isn't too serious if uh, you know you know what to do to um, kind of uh, lessen the pain and stuff like that. Uh, Kenny Omega was not was also not cleared to compete uh, at Dynamite this past week. Uh, after the brutal match that he had with um, John Moxley, of course, showed him had all sorts of freaking uh, you know cuts on his back. Of course, all scarred over now. Um, said that he took a shower and it stung quite a bit. Um, but the thing that I noticed the most was that freaking black eye that he had, you know, on his right eye, right where he uh, face planted into those freaking pine boards when he missed the Phoenix Splash. And I was like, yeah, that's gonna leave a mark, and it turned out it did because his eye was just completely black and I was like damn definitely hit those boards hard uh, John Moxley was cleared to compete but um, I'm pretty sure he was pretty sore and he wanted to get that match over with as quick as possible but um, the biggest uh, injury report came with uh, Cody of course we saw him do that face plant right into the ramp and of course it opened up a deep gash in his above his right eye uh, which required eight stitches to close and I was like yeah that was gonna need stitches and it actually needed eight of them to close but uh, if you also noticed uh, during you know while they were checking him out he was actually holding his side as well turns out that fall also caused what's known as a uh, Cotto a costo crondo uh, let me see if I can pronounce this right a costo crondo separation I believe it was called and for those of you that don't know what that is that is a separated rib which means that one of his ribs was separated from its rib cage. Ow. I can't imagine that felt good. And you could even see it during the match where if he took any like shots to his chest area. You could see it was, it was even shot one time. He's like, oh, God. Um, yeah, I don't think that was any selling on his part. I think that was actual pain because he actually he suffered a legitimate separated rib. So he's probably going to be out of action for a couple weeks at the very least till that heals. And of course, he also suffered the uh, cut above his right eye. Um, yeah, that was uh, that dive uh, did a lot more damage than we all thought. I mean, the cut above his eye was pretty obvious, but uh, you know, then hearing that he also suffered a suffer separated rib, oof, that's kind of hurt. But uh, yeah, a lot of the top stars injured after uh, full gear. But uh, they still ended up putting on a pretty good show at Dynamite, so it's all well and good, at least for right now. Um, but uh, that's your injury report uh, coming out of full gear. But um, 
now that uh, that's out of the way, let's get into uh, this week's edition. Well, first, actually, before we get into that, I gotta do um, the AEW Dark results from uh, Charlotte. They actually aired the, aired the episode on Friday this time around because of the pay-per-view. So, uh, one second, I'll uh, give you the results for that. All right, so here were the uh, results for AEW Dark from uh, the show in Charlotte. Um, uh, the match for um, bef that happened before the show, um, the official show began, was Hikaru Shida defeating uh, Big Swole. So uh, when you see the rankings at the, at the end of this uh, review, you'll see that Shida is now the number two ranked women's wrestler. So, moving yourself up into contention to challenge for the title. And then, there were two more matches that happened after um, Dynamite went off the air. There was a women's tag team match where Nyla Rose and the librarian Leva Bates defeated Shaza McKenzie and Shalandra Royal. Um, Nyla Rose didn't even bother tagging in Le Leva Bates. And Bates was like, okay, I'll just sit here and just read. And then, B Nyla Rose just completely destroyed McKenzie and Royal. And uh, Rose is actually at number four in the overall rankings right now in the women's division. And then the main event for Dark in Charlotte was Shima and SCU defeating Kip Sabian, Jack Evans, and Angelico. And those are your AEW Dark results from Charlotte. Matches work all right, I suppose. But, um, anywho, let's go ahead and get started with uh, reviewing uh, the um, seventh episode of Dynamite which took place in Nashville Tennessee um, so we start out with uh, John Moxley against Michael Nakazawa and uh, at first I was like oh Jesus Nakazawa you know the baby oil bullshit but this was not actually the case this time around because Nakazawa actually took out the baby oil, but he threw it to the side. It's like, no, this this is not the time for that. So uh, he ends up attacking Moxley right away. Uh, Moxley hits a lariat and then hits uh, the paradigm shift for the three count in the win. <laughs> this was basically a squash match. Uh, and from this point forward, uh, the original double arm DDT that he does, we'll call that the paradigm shift. But uh, the elevated variation is actually known as the death rider. So that's what we'll do to differentiate the two the regular double arm we'll do we'll call it the paradigm shift and uh then the elevated variation is the death rider that's how we'll do it but yeah this was basically a squash match uh, basically making moxley look strong after a brutal battle uh at um full gear one and a half stars out of five you know it, I, that's pretty much the best i'll give uh squash matches like this but uh, after the match, he grabs a microphone and basically starts talking. And he starts out by saying, hey, that counts, right? <laughs> because the Lights Out match with uh, Omega doesn't count because it was an unsanctioned match. And basically he starts talking about how, you know, he's going to go on a pilgrimage to uh, scorch the earth in AEW. And uh, he'll just keep going until he's the last man standing. Uh, basically implying that uh, he's going to be taking, he's going to be eyeing that AEW championship before too long. And then he says, you know, he, he respects Kenny Omega because he had the balls to do what he thinks nobody else will do, and that's step in the ring with him and actually challenge him. So he basically issued an open challenge, which uh, we'll touch on that again a little bit later on. But uh, next up, we had the Dark Order against the Jurassic Express. I mean, it was pretty obvious he was going to win this match because, I mean, the Jurassic Express with Marco Stunt as one half of the team, I mean, it's just not believable that they'll win the match. But uh, highlights of this match, um, Marco with a nice uh, tilt-a-whirl arm drag. I mean, he does some good moves. It's just him winning a match. I just, I don't know. It's just it's just not believable to me. Uh, Jungle Boy with a nice crucifix and a Frankensteiner. Uh, Marco, Marco with a cannonball senton, but then um, the Dark Order starts taking over. Uno hits a nice scissors kick and then a senton atomico for two count. Uh, that's a swanton bomb if you didn't know that. Uh, Uno with a nice pendulum backbreaker. Uh, Stu Grayson with the helo on the apron that he does really well. Does a nice stalling suplex for a two count. Uh, Dark Order do their side slam elbow drop combo for a two. Uh, Uno with a nice fall away slam for a two count. 
Uh, Marco does a nice tilt to world flatliner and then gets the hot tag. Jungle Boy does a nice form strike, a tope suicida, um, a soccer kick, and then his uh, moonsault knee drop and gets a two count out of it. Uh, Jungle Express do some super kicks. Um, there was a little bit of a botch where uh, Marco Stunt tried to uh, basically jump on the ropes but slipped off the top. <clears throat> But uh, got back up to the top rope and hits a nice Dragon Rana uh, for a two count. But uh, Dark Order take control. They hit a nice knee strike and a scissors kick uh, on Jungle Boy. Send him to the outside. Uh, Grayson hits his Nightfall Pendulum Backbreaker. And then uh, Dark Order hits their um, Gory Bomb Diamond Dust combo. They, they call the Fatality for the three count and the victory. Um, it was an all right tag match. I gave it two and a half stars out of five. Um, that's one thing that I noticed about this show was the fact that the wrestling was kind of average for the most part. But uh, the, they were fo they seemed to be focusing a little bit more on the story stuff uh, than they were the wrestling really for this show because of all the fallout from fall gear, from full gear I should say. Um, so I think they were putting a little more focus on that this week. Um, case in point, Evil Uno actually gets on the mic. And he actually has some decent mic skills. Basically, he tries to um, get Marco Stunt to join their group. Jungle Boy is like, no. So the Creepers attack both Stunt and Jungle Boy. Uh, they try to put, uh, Uno tries to put one of the Creeper masks on Jungle Boy. But then, um, the uh, Jurassic Express music hits and out comes Luchasaurus. To a huge pop from the crowd. They were basically chanting his name. Luchasaurus. And then when he actually came out. The roof came off the fucking place. I mean. Let's be completely honest here people. Luchasaurus and Jungle Boy. You know. A boy and his dinosaur. They are over as fuck. And when Luchasaurus went down with that hamstring injury. Which was just a strained hamstring. Um, it definitely took a lot of wind out of their sails a little bit. Especially considering that they were probably tagged. They would have been pegged to win the Tag Team Championship Tournament if uh, Luchasaurus hadn't gone down with that injury. But uh, he returns to a huge pop, basically takes out all of the uh, the Creepers, gets in the ring, does his uh, Tail Whip Roundhouse kick to three of the Creepers, um, hits that nice fake low high kick uh, to uh, Grayson, and hits him with a choke slam and then the standing moonsault. I mean... <sighs> For a, a guy that size to move like he does is just crazy. And uh, the, the Jurassic Express has been reunited to a huge roar from the crowd. So the the dominant duo of uh, Luchasaurus and Jungle Boy are back together once again. be interesting to see how uh, the hamstring holds up. Because um, um, Tony Schiavone even said that they, they weren't expecting Luchasaurus back until January. Um... But uh, decided to come back a little bit early. And, uh, well, <laughs> you tell from the roar of the crowd that they were really uh, wanting to get this guy back in, in the fray. So that was pretty cool. Uh, next match was a triple threat match between Sean Spears, the librarian Peter Avalon, and Darby Allen. Um, this one only went about four minutes. The matches were a lot quicker in, uh, in this show uh, than in previous shows. We went through four matches in the first hour alone, if that tells you anything. But the highlights of this match, um, Spears and Allen were basically, you know, jawing at each other. Uh, Peter Avalon tries to do a dive off the top rope, and both of them step back, and he misses. Um, Darby hits his sky-high arm drag, which always looks really good. And he also hits a nice drop kick. Uh, Spears hits a nice atomic face buster uh, for a two count on uh, Allen, I believe. Spears with a back suplex on the apron. And then Joey Janela comes out and attacks Sean Spears. Um, you might be thinking, well, why didn't this result in a disqualification? Well, there's no DQs in a triple threat match. So obviously Janela's not done with uh, Spears as far as that rivalry is concerned. Um, but in the meantime, Darby Allen and uh, Peter Avalon continue the match. Um, Darby hits his shoulder ride stunner and then hits the coffin drop for the three count and the victory. Uh, I gave this match two and a half stars out of five. And then afterwards, he grabs a microphone, and he only says four words. He says, John Moxley, which elicited a, a big pop from the crowd, because Darby Allen's super over as well. And he's and then the other two words were, I accept. And it's like, oh, shit. 
you got two crazy motherfuckers and John Moxley and Darby Allen, and they're going to be facing each other next week on Dynamite. That's going to be pretty fun to watch. Especially considering that they're both in the top five in the rankings at this point. So there's actually some stakes, you know, in this match. It's like, okay, who's going to move up the rankings? You know, in the single in the singles ladder to see who's the next guy to challenge Jericho for the title. You know what I mean? Uh, speaking of matches that are going to be taking place next week, uh, next week there's actually going to be a battle royal called the Dynamite Dozen Battle Royal, where apparently, you know, there's going to be a dozen wrestlers who are going to be competing for, I guess, a championship ring of some sort. You know, an AEW diamond ring. I don't know. Um, or basically, they compete in a battle royal. The last two then face each other and in a singles match, I guess, and, a win and the winner is the uh, Dynamite Dozen uh, winner. Uh, for this um, first edition of it, I guess. Pretty cool. It's a pretty interesting concept. I'll, I'll, I'll be interested to see how that goes next week. But uh, that's definitely got my interest peaked. Uh, next up, we have um, another squash match. Nyla Rose against uh, a debuting Danny Jordan. Um, this is basically made to just you know boost Nyla Rose up in the rankings. Um, all the offense was basically from not a lot of Rose's perspective. I mean, Danny Jordan tried to like throw some punches in and stuff, but that was about it. Um, Rose hits a big boot, a lariat, a corner splash, a Samoan drop, and then hits the beast bomb for the three count and the win. Um, I gave this one and a half stars out of five. Like I said, that's the best I can do with squash matches. Um, then afterwards, Ali was interviewed by uh, Tony Schiavone and uh, Awesome Kong and Brandy Attacker. Uh, from behind and take a lock of her hair so be interesting to see what the storyline is all about with that because uh, that's kind of interesting but we haven't really heard anything about that um, then came perhaps one of the best segments uh, of the year <laughs> uh, Chris Jericho of course comes out you know and talks about you know everything you know that happened from full gear you know how he is still the champion uh, and then uh, Cody's music hits, but it turns out that it was MJF who came out uh, and basically starts, you know, running down Cody and basically saying that, you know, you know, how he uh, basically was a manipulator, a user, an abuser. The crowd starts chanting bullshit, you know, and, and MJF was like, the only thing that's bullshit, you know, is that whatever Cody thinks, you know, or something, something of that nature. I'm paraphrasing here. But uh, then him and Jericho start talking, and, you know, they basically start talking back and forth, like, um, you know, MJF is like, uh, you want me to join the inner circle? And then Jericho's like, uh, do you want to join the inner circle? Um, I mean, there's too much to, you know, go over here to, um, to really talk about, and I couldn't really do it justice. I mean, really, you ought to just go watch it. I mean, it's up on their YouTube channel, so, I mean, I would recommend you go and watch it. It is fucking comedy gold I mean when you get two great talkers like Jericho and MJF in the ring at the same time it's just like you give those two a live mic and you let them just go it's fucking hilarious as shit I mean I would highly recommend going and watching that because it is funny as hell and then it all ends with uh, well, who is the biggest jackass in all of AEW and they both say Cody <laughs> so it's like yeah they're on the same page so I don't think MJF is a member of the inner circle because he doesn't really need him. But uh, I think they do have an alliance of sorts. Uh, and then Cody comes out, um, basically uh, tries to attack both uh, MJF and Jericho. Uh, botches uh, the first power slam they tried to do, although JR tried to do a good job of uh, playing it off. Like, well, Cody's equilibrium is not really there. But, uh, hits the second one. Uh, then has his sights set on MJF, but then out comes a debuting Wardlow. So we had been seeing you know videos of this guy for weeks, and he now comes out, and he is MJF's muscle. Um, does like a uh, fireman's carry slam, similar to like the uh, attitude adjustment, and then tries to uh, choke Cody out with his uh, own tie. So um, yeah, the elite are not looking too good right now. And uh, that kind of uh, plays into what happens in, next, in the next couple segments. Uh, the first of which is the next match up 
on the card, which was the rubber match, the official rubber match between Hangman Adam Page and Pac. So the two of these guys went fast and furious in this one, much like their first two matches. Uh, Pac starts out with a Gom and Geary. Went up to try to do the Black Arrow, but uh, Page rolled out of the way. Pac hits a nice uh, running Yakuza kick and then a Spaceman dive. And that kind of uh, took a page <laughs> out of Hangman Page's book by doing the Ariha moon Moonsault to the outside. Basically the top rope Moonsault to the outside. Uh, page hits a nice running drop kick. And then a Tope Suicida and then a pop-up powerbomb for a two count. Hits a nice big boot. Uh, but Pac uh, fires back with two front missile drop kicks. Um, Page hits the sidewalk slam on the apron and then his own Arihara Moonsault. Then it went to commercial break at this point. Uh, we come back to Pac hitting a super kick. Page hitting a roaring elbow. Pac hitting a rebound German suplex. Page following up with a discus lariat. So it's kind of back and forth between these two. Uh, Pac hits a nice uh, enziguri into a roll up for two. Page hits a super kick himself. And then a brain buster on the outside. And then a buckshot lariat for two count. Uh, but then Pac hits a scissors kick. And then just starts stomping uh, Page's head into the ground. Basically like curb stomps. Um, and then he goes up to the top rope. Hits the black arrow. And then locks in the brutalizer. Uh, Page passes out. And your winner of this series is Pac. Um, this was actually a, another really good match between the two of them. I mean, the two of them have a lot of good chemistry. Um, I gave this match four stars out of five. Uh, and then after this, we see the Young Bucks and uh, Proud and Powerful going at it. Uh, and while these two were fighting back, while these four guys were fighting backstage, jumping off of forklifts and you know putting each other through tables, super kicks, and all this other shit, had a, a bit of a cameo appearance from Orange Cassidy when. Um, one of the bathroom doors got knocked open. He's just standing there chilling. And that elicited a pop from the crowd. Um, eventually, uh, Proud and Powerful got the upper hand. Using, I guess they call it the blackjack. Which is the sock filled with baseballs. Although I think it's really just socks. But uh, they focused on Nick's injured leg. And then they did their double power bomb Through the stage on Matt. Um, Brandon Cutler tries to come out and get uh, Proud and Powerful, you know, to stop. And they start to walk away, and then they're like, we lied! And then they started attacking Cutler as well. And then Private Party comes out to uh, stop uh, Proud and Powerful. And they're going to have a match next week as well. And there's actually a little bit of a deeper meaning uh, for the two teams in this match um, than one might expect. Um, a little bit of background on that. Um... The morning of the Full Gear show, uh, one of, and this is for both Proud and Powerful and Private Party, one of their uh, old uh, training partners from uh, House of Glory Wrestling, uh, Matthew Travis, was tragically killed in a traffic accident. Uh, he was only 25 years of age, I believe. And if you've seen some of his wrestling, you know, from uh, How, um, House of Glory, um, this guy was a star in the making. And um, it really is a shame that... Uh, you know, the wrestling world lost one of its uh, top up-and-comers, in my opinion. Uh, so, um, yeah, that match next week between Private Party and Proud and Powerful, that's going to have a lot of meaning for them because they're going to be doing it in Matt's honor. And um, I think that was pretty cool of uh, the Young Bucks to book a match like that for them. You know, knowing how important tag team wrestling is. And, and how important, you know, Matthew Travis, how close they were with Matthew Travis, so. Um, <clears throat> and uh, finally, we get to our main event of the evening. The AEW World Tag Team Championship was on the line uh, between SCU, Frankie Kazarian, and Scorpio Sky, and... Members of the inner, center, inner Circle, Sammy Guevara and Chris Jericho. Now, the reason why this match uh, took place was because Jericho argued his case that him and Sammy Guevara are 2-0 and as a tag team. And it's like, well, that does make sense. So, you know, they get a, a World Tag Team Championship match here on uh, the main event of Dynamite. And considering how strong both SCU and Jericho have been uh, booked so far in AEW... Um, that actually lent to a little bit of unpredictability in this match because it's like, okay, is Jericho going to continue his run and add some more gold or is SCU going to retain? You, you truly didn't know in this case 
because both SCU and uh, Chris Jericho have been booked so strongly. So it actually added to, to like an air of unpredictability because you didn't know who was going to win, you know, which is pretty freaking awesome. But uh, highlights of this match, um, Kazarian with some nice arm drags, uh, a drop kick and a Japanese arm drag. Uh, Scorpio Sky, who's been just red hot recently, uh, hits a pendulum backbreaker for a one count, and then Kazarian hits a slingshot leg drop for a two count. Uh, Kazarian with a German suplex, tags in Scorpio Sky, hits a nice drop kick. Uh, Kazarian with his three hit combo for the two count. Um, Sammy Guevara starts getting in some offense. He hits his ground shooting star press for a two count and a Simone drop for a two count. Uh, hits his nice twisting drop kick and a Spanish, a standing Spanish fly. Uh, but misses the uh, top rope shooting star press. Uh, Scorpio Sky with a flying back elbow. Some nice drop kicks. Um, hits a nice spine buster on uh, Sammy Guevara. Rolls him through into a neck breaker. Gets a two count out of it. Um, Sammy Guevara hits a nice rising knee. But Scorpio Sky hits a slingshot cutter for a two count. Transition, transitions it into a dragon sleeper. Um, Hager of course interferes as per the usual. Uh... Because um, SCU was going for their SCU later. And uh, Hager grabbed um, Kazarian's leg. Um, uh, Christopher Daniels, who was also at ringside, tried to uh, stop Hager. But he basically gets overpowered. Um, Sammy hits a nice hook kick. But uh, Scorpio Sky hits a Thez press. And then a double stomp and a nice TKO for a two count. That kind of came out of nowhere. Uh, Jericho comes in, misses a drop kick and the lion salt, but uh, hits a nice code breaker, an anti-air code breaker on Sky for a two count. But then Scorpio Sky puts the small package, the most devastating move in all of professional wrestling, uh, on Jericho and gets the surprise three count. And I say surprise because this is actually Jericho's first pinfall loss in AEW. And I'm talking about singles, tag, anything. This is his first official pinfall loss. And they gave it to Scorpio Sky. And I'm just like, well then. They must be thinking pretty highly of Scorpio Sky if they're giving, you know, the clean pin to him over Jericho, who's the AEW champion. I mean, that's a pretty big deal. So even though, you know, Scorpio Sky hasn't competed in any singles matches uh, as of yet. But, I mean, you have to expect that maybe they're going to start booking him as a singles competitor uh, in the near future once um, Sky loses the tag team titles um, and afterwards Jericho starts throwing on AC Finn at ringside kind of reminiscent of his old uh, ways back in WCW uh, just super pissed off I gave this match three and a half stars out of five um, but uh, as for my final rating for this show I mean, like I said, the wrestling was kind of average at best. I mean, but I don't think that was the true focus, really. I mean, they had some squash matches, tried to build some guys up and gals. Um, and they were basically advancing some storylines in some cases. Um, but uh, there was some good wrestling on the show regardless. But uh, the storylines and the promos were absolute fire. Uh, overall, 7 out of 10, I think is a good score. Uh, for this week of Dynamite. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what uh, goes on from here uh, next week in Indianapolis. Uh, especially with that Dynamite Dozen Battle Royal. I'm going to be interesting to see how that turns out. But uh, yeah, that's pretty much going to do it for this week on All Elite Review. Um, thank you very much for watching. Um, and here are the updated uh, rankings that they have for all the uh, divisions. So, thank you very much for watching, and until next time, this is the Packer Man, signing out. Bye.
is all for today's video. Thank you very much for watching. Be sure to rate, comment, favorite, like, and subscribe to my channels here on YouTube.com and over on BitChute.com. If you would like to sponsor my channel, go to my channel page at Subscribestar.com. Thank you very much for watching, and until next time, this is the Packer Man, signing out. Have a good one.